So in this lecture, we're going to talk about basic blockchain. The emphasis will inevitably be on the basic bit. Now, blockchain contains many different facets as a subject, and I do want to try and give you as broad a perspective as possible. Now, within that, there are some elements of hard math and computer science that are important. Okay, and I can't really do that justice in this set of lectures, although it, I think it's important to recognise that there is this element and this underpinning to the subject of blockchain. So I will try and clarify exactly what blockchain is later in the lecture, but for the moment, just think of it as being the foundational technology that underpins Bitcoin. Now, of course, blockchain can do more than that, much more than that indeed, and there's you know, a lot of potential in terms of future blockchain applications, but the first way in which blockchain came to prominence was as the foundational technology behind Bitcoin. Okay, and as I said before, just remember that this subject is multifaceted and there is a significant uh, computer science and computational aspect that does sit behind this that I can't necessarily do justice. Okay, but there are certain things here that are very important and indeed some important guiding principles that I will go on to mention throughout this set of lectures. So in terms of background reading then, one of the books that I will be drawing from is this book here by Shreya, published last year, on basic blockchain. So the idea behind this is that blockchain does offer the potential for foundational societal change. Okay, and just to say here, this is a popular science book and it is actually rare that something I teach has such broad popular appeal. Again, this goes back to the huge potential that blockchain has for potentially foundational societal change. So in some ways you can just think of blockchain as just being the foundational technology that sits behind Bitcoin. And whilst this is true, there's a potential for blockchain to do a whole lot more than that besides. Okay, and then there are some fundamental principles that sit behind blockchain that derive from computer science. Okay, so we're going to, in this course, cover really more the philosophical aspect of this rather than nuts and bolts computation. But there are two things to really watch out for here. Firstly, this notion of trying to establish trust in trustless environments. And secondly, this notion of not necessarily being able to make a network immune to attack, but to render those attacks too computationally expensive. OK, so when it comes to Bitcoin and blockchain and blockchain in particular, there are these two crucial parts to bear in mind at all times. Firstly, this idea of trying to establish trust in trustless environments. Secondly, this idea that you can't necessarily stop an attack on your network, but you can make it computationally expensive. So as it says there, then blockchain is a special kind of database initially created to support a new digital currency called Bitcoin, although blockchain goes a lot deeper than this. Blockchain initially grew out of a need to create digital trust in a trustless environment. And in the case of Bitcoin, where we've begun to lose trust in financial institutions and indeed national governments. So financial institutions following the crash of 2008, national governments following the progressive devaluation of national currencies. So the blockchain system aims to use clever mathematics to achieve something called consensus. What we mean by consensus is common agreement about what is true amongst parties who don't have to trust each other. OK, so this fundamental principle here is trying to establish trust in a trustless environment. And within this, the system is intended to embed economic incentives to run a large network on computers used by many people. So the idea is that you can try and establish trust without necessarily relying on a central hub like an equivalent of the Bank of England. So as I said before, then, one of these core themes that underpins the construction and the conceptualization of blockchain is this need to create and establish trust in a trustless environment. Now, this has been given a classical name called the Byzantine Generals problem. And the idea is that you want to coordinate action in such a way 
that people will behave in a coordinated manner even if they don't trust each other. So historically the idea was how can you get a group of people, for example a group of generals in the Byzantine era who don't trust each other to obey the command at the same time and attack or retreat in unison. So the second classical principle that I mentioned earlier is that you don't necessarily want to stop an attack, you just want to render any attack on the system computationally expensive. So with this classical Byzantine generals problem, if two thirds of the system participants are loyal and agree on the veracity of the information, then the system will function as intended. So the idea is you've got this redundancy built in as a safety mechanism. Okay, when you translate this to modern computer networks, what you're really trying to do is it's not really about stopping attacks per se, it's really more about trying to make these attacks too computationally expensive. So this idea then of having robustness built into the system is often known as being Byzantine fault tolerant. So the basic idea then is you have some robustness built into the system by having some redundancy. This gives you a way of protecting against attacks primarily, but some robustness against other things as well. So that if you have a computer network that is built to be Byzantine fault tolerant, it will work for example, under failure of a third of the network's computers. So the ideal has natural high profile applications in, for example, aerospace and NASA, etc. And I ought to say here that even with modern systems, it's worth considering having some degree of redundancy as a safety device. So this is one of the problems that's been highlighted with the recent uh, problems with the Boeing 737 MAX. So recent problems with the Boeing 737 MAX shows that this idea of having Byzantine fault tolerant systems is potentially painfully relevant. Okay, it doesn't necessarily go away as your system gets whizzier and more technologically adept. Okay, this is fundamental idea with respect to aerospace applications that you want some redundancy in the system as a safety device. So there are strict limits on the extent I can do this justice in this set of lectures. But blockchain is fundamentally a computational subject. However, within that, blockchain is also multifaceted, so it's necessarily bigger than any one individual discipline. So the Bitcoin blockchain, for example, is variously a distributed ledger to keep track of new digital currency, so a database with many copies that all update themselves automatically. It uses Byzantine consensus to govern changes to the ledger. So there's some inbuilt redundancy as a safety device. And the idea is that with Bitcoin applications, you get a cryptographically secure currency. So what you've got is a secure cryptographic system that was originally designed to sit behind a digital currency, but can be used in other applications as well. Within this, Bitcoin incorporates mining incentives to encourage people to run the computer cycles necessary to manage the currency. And then blocks of transactions describing when people trade the currency are strung together in a computer science device called a Merkle tree to form an immutable blockchain. So this is the reason for the term blockchain. You've got blocks of transactions chained together using this Merkle tree structure. Okay, so in terms of a distributed ledger, what do I mean by that? So all blockchains are distributed ledgers, but not all distributed ledgers are blockchains. But the basic idea is as follows. So suppose you have a ledger with many identical copies. Suppose these copies can talk to each other and automatically update themselves. So the aim, as we saw before with Byzantine fault tolerance, is to create resilience in the network so that if one copy is del deliberately corrupted, i.e. comes under attack, the other copies can come to the rescue and fix the problem and you still have this notion of consensus even if a certain fraction of the network becomes corrupted. So the idea is to have what's known as a peer-to-peer -peer network to protect against fraud or embezzlement. 
this notion of establishing trust in a trustless environment. So this is done between individual nodes rather than having a single entity like, say, the government or the Bank of England. And in particular with Bitcoin, like we said before, there's no equivalent of the Bank of England, so no central hub in charge. But at the same time, no central hub that can be attacked or indeed otherwise corrupted. And if you create the network in the right way, the idea is that the thing can be governed safely just by interactions between microscopic components of that network. So for Byzantine fault tolerance, then, the two basic things, as we said before, was trying to solve a problem of establishing trust in a trustless environment. And it's not necessarily about stopping attacks per se. It's just about making attacks on the network computationally expensive and hopefully prohibitively computationally expensive. So it's important, I think, to sort of bear in mind where you want to ultimately want to go. So imagine a network of information of storage devices or nodes. And if you want to change the information stored in the network, you need to convince more than 50 percent of the nodes in the network that the information is valid. So if you've got a system with, say, 10,000 nodes, you would need to corrupt 5,001 nodes in a short time in order to sow faulty information into the network. OK, so it's potentially a big deal. It's not about just attacking one individual component. You simultaneously have to attack 5,001 components. So it may not be impossible per se, but the idea is that this becomes computationally and resource expensive very, very quickly. So the basic underlying principle behind this, which is important to sort of comprehend, is that whilst fraud is not impossible, it's hopefully at the very least computationally expensive. It's not necessarily worth somebody's time in terms of attacking the network and the resources they would need in order to be successful. So again, as I tried to say before, it's important that you recognise that blockchain is fundamentally computational subject at its core. So the idea is that you have blocks of transactions that are chained together using Merkle trees. And as you have these blocks chained together, you get the name blockchain. So Merkle trees are an interesting maths and computer science thing, but really the point here is something called immutability. And this sort of practical perspective is really the main point to bear in mind here. So this notion of immutability is all about solving this fundamental problem. How do you build trust into a trustless system and a trustless environment? So if you have immutability, what you're aiming to do is produce a record of every transaction that everybody can see. And this record of the previous transactions cannot be altered. And then the way this is achieved on the blockchain is to use an interesting mathematical and computer science thing called a Merkle tree, which helps you to establish this immutable, almost immovable history of transactions. So the idea is that if everything is transparent and you can see everything, you therefore necessarily have trust in a fundamentally trustless environment. So with respect to cryptocurrencies, what you have to do in this trustless environment is try and get around this so-called double spend problem. So the idea is if I give you a digital dollar, I don't have, still have the ability to spend that dollar somewhere else. OK, so there's only one copy of each sort of digital dollar kicking about this virtual universe. So this problem is solved in relatively mundane ways in non-digital currencies, for example, by the physical exchange of coins and notes and indeed Coins were the first thing, then notes, paper notes, paper money came in after that as a way of facilitating easier transfer of funds in everyday transactions. Conventional banking systems also solve this double spend problem, often in hideously outdated ways. So at the turn of the century, even often banking systems relied on postal systems. So it's remarkable, I think, just how outdated some of the commonly used uh, technology underpinning banking systems was and arguably is to a certain extent today. So this is the basic problem then that you want to solve in the Bitcoin blockchain. How do you ensure that the same digital dollar 
cannot be transferred to more than one party simultaneously.